Okay, hi everyone. So thanks for coming. Um, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Kelsey. I am a master's student in animal science at UNH, so it's, I'm really lucky to be out here in California. Beautiful weather. Um, we're getting some snow this weekend, so I'm trying to prolong my visit here as long as possible. Um, so my master's project is on feeding annual forage crops to organic dairy cows during the spring and summer seasons in the Northeast United States. Alrighty, so this is an outline of what I'll be talking about today. Our, I'll start with the background of my research project, why we decided to do it, and why we think it's important. I'll talk about the objectives of the study then. Then I'll touch, about, touch upon the methodology used, the results we saw, the conclusions we made, and then I will talk about further research um, that we'll be doing this year and in future years, and then I'll take any questions. So this uh, project was funded, funded under a USDA SARE grant um, where forage-based approaches were, um, were looked at for improving profitability and ecosystem services for organic dairy farms. There are two sort of goals to this project. The first was to um, mitigate supplemental grain costs and whole farm greenhouse gas emissions um, through enhanced forage intake and a better soil carbon to nitrogen ratio. The second goal was to improve soil health and pest management through the diversification of pasture and silage crop rotations. So this is what a typical pasture season looks, looks like in terms of biomass production in the Northeast. Um, so how much feed is the pasture actually producing for the animal at different parts of the year? As you see, there's two um, kind of points of high productivity. The first point is, there we go, is late spring, early summer. This is when forages have come back from being overwintered. They're established and they're at a time of optimal vegetative growth and very high nutrient quality. The second time of high productivity is late summer, early fall. This is when temperatures have become more mild after the really <laughs> hot season, midsummer. Forages are back to yielding higher quality feeds. And farmers really like to take advantage of these times of high productivity. Um, so instead of sending their cows back to the barn to get a TMR, um, and you're supplementing that forage with um, haylage and baleage, you can send them out to pasture, collect their own feed. And really, that's what grazing is all about. It's using cattle to harvest their own feed, replenishing the land with their own waste. Um, it's this complex web of ecosystem management that allows agricultural plants and animals to regulate their own habitat. You'll also notice these slumps in productivity. Um, and these occur in the early spring when, when pasture just has, hasn't established yet. Midsummer when it's just too hot and too dry for plants to really grow and thrive. And then late fall when, when plants just can't keep up with the cooler temperatures. So this is when um, farmers will supplement with haylage, baleage, feeds that basically cost money and labor uh, to produce, to store, and then to feed out. So why is this so important? So um, the most imperative to probably this group of people, organic agriculture has been rising in the U.S. for years. Uh, the USDA ERS stated that retail sales of organic milk has been growing since the mid-1990s. <coughs> Excuse me. The number of certified organic milk cows has more than doubled from 38,000 in 2000 to 86,000 in 2005. The number of organic pasture acreage has jumped from 557,000 acres in 2000 to over 2.2 million acres in 2005. So we're seeing this huge, huge transition of conventional to organic. So it's important to note that in order to be considered organic dairy, you need to graze your cows for at least a minimum of 120 days per year, and you need at least 30% of that feed to be coming from the grazing. <clears throat> Organic producers aren't the only ones utilizing grazing, though. Um, a survey involving 987 dairy producers in four north, northern, northeastern states reported that 93% of dairy producers use grazing as a feed source. Another survey from the University of Wisconsin reported management-intensive grazing more than tripled from 1993 to 2000. So it's clear that the use of grazing as some sort of feed source is growing um, in this industry, and it's being more and more used. <clears throat> And this is because labor and feed are, cost a lot of money. It's the leading cost on any dairy farm. Um, a survey of Wisconsin dairy producers reported labor on grazing dairy farms averaged 102 acres per week, 
and labor on conventional dairy farms averaged 148 hours per week. We see dairies that have a higher utilization of pasture in their diet also have a lower average feed cost per cow. So management intensive grazing is a practical way to reduce on-farm feed costs and labor use. <clears throat> so back to this typical pasture, uh, pasture season. Um, what we wanted to do with this project was basically take these slumps in the pasture and try and fill them in with seasonal specific annual forages. So the first uh, trial of the study was in the spring and this occurred from mid-May to early June out in New Hampshire. Um, the species used were some small grains like wheat, triticale, barley, and rye, and then we used hairy vetch as a legume. So the goal of these species were to be their hardy and their cold tolerance, so they would establish hopefully an earlier uh, pasture season for the cows so we could get the cows out earlier. <clears throat> the second trial was in the summer, and this occurred from mid-May or mid-July to early August. <clears throat> And the species used were some warm season grasses like teff and millet. Um, we used buckwheat as a broadleaf. We used oats and then chickling vetch as our legume. And these would hopefully be able to withstand this, this hot, dry weather that we typically see out in New Hampshire um, right in the middle of the season. So our third trial was expected to occur in the late fall, so around September, October. Um, unfortunately, we had some very, very dry conditions. I don't want to say drought-like conditions because I know California ex experienced an actual drought. So, um, But we had a very untypical dry season. So when we planted these uh, <clears throat> species in like late August and expected them to come up, none of them germinated. So unfortunately, we did not have a fall season. Um, so the 2015 trial only consisted of spring AFC and summer AFC. So that's what I'll be talking about. So this is where the University of New Hampshire is located. It's in Durham, New Hampshire. It's right on the seacoast, about an hour north of Boston. And then our organic dairy facility is called the Burley Demerit Organic Dairy Research Farm. It's in Lee, New Hampshire, which is about a 10 minute drive from Durham, New Hampshire. And it's operated by the New Hampshire Agricultural Experiment Station and UNH's College of Life Science and Agriculture. We have about 300 acres, 140 of which are in crop production and then 40 are in pastures. We have a milking jersey herd that ranges from about 40 to 50 cows, depending on the time of year. And then our pastures are on an intensive grazing um, rotational system. So the objectives of this study were sort of twofold. The first was animal-based, and that was to determine the impact of AFC on animal production and efficiency. So milk yield, milk composition, dry matter intake, grazing behavior, um, energy expenditure, room and metabolism. The second part of the study was more plant-based, and we wanted to determine the impact of AFC on pasture productivity efficiency. So biomass production, pasture quality, pasture extension, um, botanical composition. So how did we do this? We used 16 cows in the spring and 20 in the summer. They were completely randomized into a control or an AFC treatment. 60% of their dry matter came from a TMR that was fed in the barn. We used individual, individual calendars, um, so each cow was equipped with a um, little transmitter around her neck, which opened one door, so that's how she got her TMR. And then 40% of her dry matter came from the pasture. And how we kind of planted the pasture or prepared the pasture was we used two to four acre paddocks each season, so each uh, the spring and the summer, each had two different paddocks. One was control, one was AFC. <clears throat> both were both paddocks were mowed or grazed down to about seven centimeters the season before the intended grazing period. So the spring was grazed down in the fall and the summer was grazed down in the spring. The control paddock just consisted, consisted of our traditional perennial pasture that we see out in New Hampshire. So this includes uh, Timothy, orchard grass, white clover, alfalfa, Kentucky bluegrass. Um, the AFC paddock consisted of our traditional perennial pasture, and then it was strip tilled, and then it was seeded with the season specific AFC. When the pasture was about six to eight inches, the 14 day diet adaptation period began, and then after the two weeks of diet adaptation, a seven week sampling period began. 
And during the sampling week, we collected everything from feed, pasture, blood, rumen, fecal, milk, everything you could possibly think of. Um, and those will get, give us a little insight on animal metabolism, productivity. We also measured um, methane production, carbon dioxide production, and oxygen consumption. And th these were measured using a gas quantification system called the green feed, which is seen in the bottom left picture. Um, this green feed, basically each cow is equipped with a, an identification ear tag. They're then kind of lured into the green feed in the hopes of getting grain. As they're eating the grain, um, a fan is sucking up their breath and they're spitting back this data for us. So energy expenditure and behavior and grazing behavior were also measured with GPS, which is seen around her neck, um, a heart rate monitor, which is kind of around her belly, and then a pedometer, which is on her rear leg. Um, and that's called an ice tag by Ice Robotics. Um, all this data was then analyzed by, by SAS or will be analyzed by, by SAS. So this is a little of the uh, data we have so far. This is the pasture biomass production for spring. So as you can see, week one and week two, AFC did produce a little bit more. Where we really see this huge difference, though, is week three, where you see this 1,000 kilogram difference in dry matter per hectare between the AFC and the control, where the AFC produced more. And that was really exciting to see because that was kind of the whole point of the experiment to try and get um, you know, pasture producing more um, than the traditional pasture. Uh, nutrient composition stayed relatively the same as well. So crude protein and neutral detergent fiber didn't really change. Uh, that was also exciting, exciting to see because not only was the AFC producing more, it was producing high quality feed. And then the animal performance for spring, we didn't really see that much difference either. Um, intake stayed the same, milk yield components, whether it was fat or protein. We did see a trend in MUN, uh, milk, urea, and nitrogen, where AFC spring was a little bit higher. We're still not completely sure on that. That could be a, a variety of reasons. We weren't too concerned about it though, so, but we're still looking into that. Um, the AFC summer also gave us some pretty good cool data, completely opposite from, from spring, but equally as important. Um, week one, we see a little bit of a jump in AFC productivity. Week two, control is producing more. And then week three, they kind of level out. So really traditional and AFC weren't really um, producing anything different from each other. And then pasture uh, nutrient composition, we see kind of the same thing where uh, crude protein and NDF aren't really changing. <laughs> What is interesting though, um, pasture intake, I'm not sure where the p-value is up there, it should be, um, was a lot higher for AFC summer where um, the AFC cows were just eating a lot more pasture, which made the total intake a lot higher than the traditional. Um, so milk yield didn't change, although milk fat percentage, milk fat yield, milk protein percentage, and milk protein yield um, were all significantly higher in the AFC summer cows, and that we are guessing because they were eating more. Um, where we can hypothesize why they're eating more, since this experiment did take place in this really hot, um, dry weather climate time period out in New Hampshire, <coughs> um, the AFC species, they were specifically planted to do well during this time. So we kind of hypothesized that while the pasture, uh, the traditional pasture, just wasn't appetizing, it was dry, it was dying, it was brown. Um, the AFC species were kind of taking off, and even though the AFCs weren't producing more, the species weren't producing more, they just looked more appealing to eat. So they were green, they were lush, the buckwheat had flowers, and the cows just wanted to eat them. <clears throat> so basically the conclusions that we've made from this 2015 trial is that strip tilling AFC into traditional pasture improved biomass in the spring but not the summer. Strip tilling AFC into tr traditional pasture did not improve animal performance in the spring but it improved pasture intake, milk fat, and milk protein in the summer. So inconsistent, inconsistent biomass and animal performance data between seasons definitely requires further research. So speaking of further research, um, <laughs> One thing we would be interested in doing, we originally going into the study, we kind of wanted to full till and not only strip till. Um, we were kind of reluctant to do that because we weren't too sure how farmers would take that, if they would want to go out and 
completely till up one of their fields and plant um, these new forages in their fields, not knowing what would happen. Our own farm manager was very reluctant to do that. So we kind of started off strip tilling. Um, another, you know, huge aspect of this study was to benefit ecosystem services as well. So I think we started off with strip tilling um, to benefit those ecosystem services. So, so to preserve diverse ability, um, to preserve like that, that good root system that you see under the soil. To, so it would be interesting to see if we planted full till and just the entire field of AFCs, but we started off with strip tilling, maybe next year. <clears throat> the other thing that we would be interested in seeing is um, starting grazing the AFCs sooner than the control. So even though, even though the, um, the AFCs were ready to be grazed earlier in the season than the traditional pasture. Um, we didn't send them out because we weren't really sure about the parameters and, and really methods of how to measure that. Um, so going into it, like I said, with the full till strip till thing, going into it, we had a lot of questions that we still needed to ask and answers that we still needed to get before making these huge decisions. So. This study will be repeated this year. Um, I like to think of this 2015 trial as like a little test run. We got good data out of it and we'll definitely use that data. But I think now that we know how to run a study like that and, and what we really want to get out of it, we can kind of ask more questions, make more <coughs> hypotheses. So we really can give farmers the best, most educated answer on if they want to grow annuals how do they do it? What annual annuals do they need? Um, what methods need to be uh, used? Um, so they can prolong the grazing season. They can keep the cows out to pasture as long as possible and still keep up with milk yields and milk composition. So that's it. Questions? Yes. Were the, was the spring grains <laughs> spring planted or were they planted the fall before? So were the spring grains spring the planted. Um, the spring grains were overwintered, so they were planted the fall so before. Fall yes. Yes. So the question was, um, if you planted in a full till field, would you lose the effect of an established pasture? And yes, that's basically why we didn't do it the first time. We got a lot of um, our agroecologist, Dr. Rich Smith, he was like, no, we need to strip till it or no till it. Um, my advisor is more so on the side of kind of wanting to see what this would do to animal performance. So he was more on the no-till or full-till side. Um, so we kind of did this happy medium of strip tilling. So yeah, but you would lose a lot of um, ecosystem services like pest management, you know, huge deal was pest management diversity. So how do you preserve those by fully tilling? So 